It's just very low. All right. So here's the second half of the evening. That was a fantastic visit from Clay. I appreciate the fact that he came over. I hope you do too. Um, but we're going to take a, a shift now to the era of commercial. And I think this is going to be a fascinating session. Uh, it's going to be chaired by Dennis Stone, who is the Assistant Manager for Commercial Space Development in NASA's Commercial Crew and Cargo Program at JSC. He has been the uh, chair of the business committee for both of the COTS competitions, and that stands for Commercial um, Orbital Transportation Services. I always mess that up. I want to say off the shelf. Commercial Orbital Transportation Services. Yeah, yeah. Um, he spent 20 years in NASA uh, working on the space station program in a variety of positions, including chief systems engineer of the Assured Crew Return Vehicle, manager of the avionics integration, and co-chair of the ISS Commercialization Working Group. Prior to working for NASA, he's worked for McDonnell Douglas, Ford Aerospace, and Rockwell. He has a bachelor's degree in physics and in electrical engineering uh, from the University of Hawaii, an associate fellow of the AIAA and advocate of the Space Frontier Foundation. Please welcome Dennis Stone. Thank you, Jim, and uh, thanks everybody for coming out on the weekend to show your support for space and uh, tonight your interest in commercial space. This is something that uh, I've been in interested in for, uh, well, for a long time, shall we say, and I'm so, so proud and honored to be part of uh, <laughs> uh, really a new and exciting effort by NASA to stimulate the commercial space sector. And we're doing this in, in several ways. We started about five years ago with COTS uh, and uh, Commercial Orbital Transportation Services. And this is the two-phase program. The first phase, NASA is an investor. Uh, we had $500 million and we were invested in two companies, uh, SpaceX and Orbital Sciences, that are developing the ability to fly cargo uh, to, and in some cases from, back from the space station. Um, and this first phase is one of development and demonstration. The second phase is a contract uh, from the ISS program, the Commercial uh, Resupply Services Contract, or CRS, and that's a multi-billion dollar contract. So we're, we're putting our money where our mouth is, and we're really trying to, to get the commercial space sector uh, routinely carrying cargo to and from low Earth orbit. Um, we're also beginning to make uh, small steps toward uh, the next logical step, which is to allow commercial industry to carry people, uh, beginning with our astronauts, up and down to low Earth orbit. Um, CCDEV uh, is a commercial crew development program. Uh, we're just finishing up right now with a $50 million investment in activities of five companies along those lines, and proposals are in for CCDEV2 right now, uh, next step. And uh, we'll see what the, the budget says uh, next week about the full commercial crew program, but we're uh, Last year, the president had proposed a nearly $6 billion commercial crew program. Um, so we're really excited about, uh, about this, this new exciting program to really develop <clears throat> commercialization of low Earth orbit and, uh, and help, help free NASA up to go, go back and do the Lewis and Clark stuff that we do so well. Um, and we have a great, uh, a great uh, panel of six companies here today, uh, rather than read your bios, which I don't even have. Um, I'm going to let you introduce yourselves as you begin. So we're going to start with uh, John Curry of uh, Sierra Nevada. Can everybody hear me on this? OK. So I'll let you do the, uh, the charts. We'll start with the charts. Um, I think most of you here at the Johnson Space Center in the Clear Lake area might know me, but uh, my name's John Curry. I've worked at uh, JSC right down the street here for the last uh, 23 years, uh, first as a flight controller, and then I was a flight director for about 10 years uh, on a shuttle on the space station. Uh, and then uh, my last uh, shuttle flight was STS 116, a 12 1 mission. Uh, that ended in December of 06, and then uh, in January of 07, Jeff Hanley gave me a call and asked me to go work on Orion. Uh, which I did work on the Orion project as a vehicle integration manager. I've got a lot of blood, sweat, and tears on that space. 
Uh, so I look forward to eventually seeing it fly, and I want to make sure that that's one of the things that you get is that, that uh, you know, space flight is, is important no matter what particular vehicle you're talking about, and uh, that's a good vehicle. Uh, I spent a lot of time on it. Uh, so I did that from, uh, from 2007 until 2009, and then uh, got promotion uh, up to Constellation Design Integration Manager, uh, and that was going really well up until February 1st, and then uh, things changed a little bit. Um, you guys are laughing, so you know what, what happened after that. And so, so after that point, um, after uh, working on that uh, for another few months, I went ahead and took a job with uh, Jim Boss and Mark Sarangelo and working on uh, Sierra Nevada Corporation. So that's what I'm going to talk to you about is what, what, uh, what we have been doing at Sierra Nevada uh, with respect to commercial space and, uh, and the space vehicle that we have. So next chart. Let's see, these are just the questions I think that uh, Cindy asked me to, asked us to say something about, so hopefully I'll cover these at, at uh, some level where it says the progress made over the past year. We didn't do anything with COTS. Uh, that was, uh, like, like he said, that was Orbital and SpaceX, so I'm going to concentrate on the CC Dev 1 progress, and then I'll briefly touch on the other two things. I think I've got 10 minutes, so I need to go fast. Next chart. Um, a lot of people don't know much about Sierra Nevada. I didn't know much about Sierra Nevada when I first started. It is not the beer company, although I wish it probably was. Um, I always say that, and I get, that, I get asked that question all the time, so I keep telling Mark we just need to buy them so that we can actually have the beer keg with us. Um, Sierra Nevada actually, as a company, has been around for a long time. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but they did a lot of work. They still do very good work. Uh, in, in defense uh, side of things. And so there's seven groups here that you see on these charts um, that have been around. The six to the left have been around for a long period of time. The one on the right is the one I'm going to concentrate on, which is the systems group. That was formed in uh, 2008. And so the company was doing so well that they wanted to, to venture out a little bit more into the space sector. And so, but there's a lot of good work over here on this company that's been around for a very long time. I'd spend more time on it. Um, if we had more time, but that may work. So, on the space systems part, in 2008, Sierra Nevada acquired three different companies, Microsat Systems, StarSys, and then SpaceDev, uh, which y'all have heard something about from the previous time. And so that now comprises Sierra Nevada Corporation. So it's a pretty big company, uh, over $1.2 billion in orders last, last year. Uh, so not a small company, been doing, doing this for a long time have components and parts and pieces on over 300 space missions, and some of this stuff is shown uh, on here. Next chart. So on Space Systems Group, again, we've got basically four product lines, spacecraft systems type stuff, which is shown up here, including things like the Orbcom Gen 2 satellite, which is a uh, more of an assembly line type contract where they're uh, building a number of satellites to, to put into space, and I think SpaceX is launching one of those on a Falcon 9 here coming up uh, soon. And so that's a multi-satellite service that actually, like tracking uh, packages and those kind of things, what those satellites do. Uh, subsystems and components, there's a lot of components that uh, we have put together. Uh, very proud of that record that they've been doing, and that's in the in Louisville area where I commute to uh, every single week. All of these things are uh, with, with this one. Space exploration systems is the area I work on. I'll concentrate on Dream Chaser here in a minute. And then on a prop systems, uh, most of you guys probably are aware, have heard, if you're sitting here listening about commercial space, uh, Bert Rutan uh, was able to successfully uh, do the Spaceship One uh, flight, and that was the motor that was used to get Spaceship One up was built by Space Dev, which is now Sierra Nevada. Uh, so next chart. So this is the, the, just the chart summarizing all the capabilities and things that we've done, the 4,000 components. Mark Sarangelo, when he briefs us, always very proud of the fact that we've had over 4,000 components on 300 space missions and not a one of them has broken yet. Uh, for example, Spirit and Opportunity that are on the surface of the moon, all the moving parts on those things are there. Next chart. So on the space systems locations, uh, this is where the, some, of, like, some of the parts are built, uh, like uh, environmental control and life support part. I mentioned Orion earlier, for example, some of the parts that Hamilton, and this is their sub to Hamilton that comes out of that, that area there. Uh, the Poway, California plant is where the rocket motors are, are built, and then the test facility for the rocket motors is also in California, uh, not that far off. And then Houston, we're just now uh, starting to set that up. I am the, the guy that's going to be starting to set up the, uh, the Houston office of that. And the main focus of where we're, we're, uh, we're doing all of the 
component work and actually going to be putting the Dream Chaser together, including the one that uh, we're working on now is out of Louisville, Colorado, which is uh, just south of Boulder, if you guys know. Beautiful place, when it's not minus 20. Uh, so this is a picture of the Dream Chaser. It's a winged vehicle. That, uh, so now I'm going to focus specifically on the space exploration systems. Uh, it's a winged vehicle. Uh, this is shown docking to Node 2 Forward, which is the, the, one of the two ports that uh, NASA has been working, us, working on us for. Uh, I'm working on the integrated system thing. That's why Jim uh, handed this job to me to make sure that that'll work. Got a lot of experience with space station. Um, the scale, if you compare this to the space shuttle, distance from nose to tail is about 30 feet. And from tip to tip on the airfoil wings, it's about 27 feet. Just to give you an idea of the size. Seven people inside the cabin. Two, two pilots and then five passengers. Next chart. A lot of people don't realize that the, the shape that I was just showing you flew in orbit. Uh, the Russians did it on a spiral, what they called the spiral program back in the uh, late 70s and early 80s. Uh, what they called the BOR-4. Sox may remember. I don't remember what the acronym is, what BOR stands for, but it's some Russian acronym that basically means being able to do these orbital uh, missions um, and reentry. And they did that all prior to the Buran program, got a lot of TPS uh, knowledge on the fact that, that uh, that system would work. And I don't, the picture's not shown here, but an Australian P3 apparently saw the thing being pulled out of the water. They took the photo, sent it up to, to Langley or wherever, and then somebody asked Langley, uh, CIA or whoever to reverse engineer the thing and that turned into what we call the HL-20. So the HL-20 has got over 2,000 wind tunnels, 2,000 uh, wind tunnel tests that were performed during that period of time and for a brief period of time, if you look at history, this, the HL-20 was going to be the manned space, next generation manned spacecraft uh, and then things changed a little bit and Dan Golden came in and uh, things got overcome by events, and we ended up with the X-38 uh, that was managed out of JSC. But it was nothing to do with the design. It had to do with just what, what NASA thought was the, the thing that they wanted to go with. And so we went out of the JSC design chart. So that's the Dream Chaser heritage. It's got a lot of good heritage from the NASA HL-20. I already mentioned that it's 7-crew capable. One of the things, just like uh, Keith and I were talking two minutes, so I need to go faster. This is the capability of the vehicle. Uh, it launches on top of an Atlas V. Jeff will talk about that, so next chart. Um, we've been working on this for quite a while. Next chart. <laughs> so, so the accomplishments. Hey, two minutes, I can make it happen. So these are the four milestones that we did during CCDev 1. There's a lot of good stuff. It's very hardware production centric. I, I like that. It's one of the things I like this. You know, you can show tangible progress when people, you cannot dispute hardware. So that's what we did. We built the tools to make this, and so this is turning in what we call the engineering test article, and that is going to be the vehicle that we're planning to drop from uh, 45,000 feet next year. So, and we'll go back one more real quick. We also did a hybrid, what we were talking about, what we call the hybrid motors that are used on the back of the Dream Chaser. Uh, that, that's a, a rubber, green propellant, rubber, and nitrous oxide is the way that's done, just like on Spaceship One. What we did different from what Spaceship One does, we had to prove that it works in a vacuum, because Spaceship One was doing it in the air. We did multi-start capability to show that you could do it for rendezvous and deorbit. Next chart. This is the other stuff that we did, a lot of GNC work. Um, next chart. A lot of other work. I'm not, I'm not giving it due credit on what we were able to accomplish. Next chart. Um, and then I think if I've got one minute, the last thing I'd like to show is we partnered with the uh, University of Colorado Boulder, some grad students did a, uh, built a 1-6 scale model of this thing, and can we queue up the video? And it takes, it's less than a minute. But University of Colorado Boulder did this um, with us. You know, they, the students built this uh, vehicle. Sorry for the noise. So this is showing, I don't know if you can hear me, but this is what the students, this is what the students doing the work on this. A scale model of the Dream Chaser was created. The model was subjected to both functional and flight tests. Five seconds. So this was uh, December 9th. Good job, good job. Confirm release. Remember, there's nothing wrong with the, with the design of the vehicle that's causing oscillation. It's just because
because of the way that the not performing nominally. Anyway, that's the kind of things that I like about working in this commercial stuff, and I'm on, each one of these other folks is going to give you a chance to do that, but we did that with a very small amount of money with the University of Colorado, and I thought the students did all that. I thought they did, did a very good job, uh, all things being equal. Do I need to give up my time now that it's time? I think I'm the last chart or two. I think we were just down to the last chart or two. This is all the folks we're partnered with. Next chart. So there were some questions about what we'd want to do, and I think everybody, I'm not, I won't necessarily go through this, but this was one of the questions about how we can all work together. And, and, you know, all of us, spaces, everybody has a common goal. The reason you guys are sitting in this room and hopefully some people watching on the TV is everybody believes that the shan't shouldn't be it, you know. The space shuttle is a wonderful machine, and we're about to lose a huge capability. And that's why all of us believe in this. We're all bonded together to put this thing together. And I mentioned Orion, a key thing on that last bit there, the ISS crew transportation and beyond LEO exploration are two totally different things. Orion should go down. And LEO, we've been doing for a long time. Commercial, in and out, the time has come. I wouldn't be working here, and I think these folks who are about to talk wouldn't, would agree with me. Next chart. The last chart. So um, one quick thing about we're going to be doing with JSC. Obviously, there's a lot of us that worked here. My boss is Jim Voss, who uh, you guys uh, may or may not know, but he's an astronaut who flew just like uh, Brian and Sox. Great guy to work for. Mary Sanchez was the X-38 deputy program manager. I did a lot of stuff. So I know a lot about JSC capabilities. I know about, a lot about Clear Lake, and that's why we're setting up a Houston office. We are working on a Space Act agreement right now with JSC. Do some JSC work for us, uh, and we're going to keep doing that and, and setting that up. Great, that's all I had. Thanks, John. Sorry to make you dance there near the end, but you did well. Um, next up, uh, Keith Riley of Boeing. I'll try to go. Can you hear me here? Okay. I'll try to go pretty quick. Uh, some stuff. Can I have your charts? I hadn't seen some of that stuff. <laughs> He's kidding. <laughs> <laughs> now, we are competing, so everybody understand that the, the guys here are competing against each other. So it's sort of a little dynamic. Um, we're having some fun. Uh, my name is Keith Riley. Uh, as far as history, you know, I worked in the space industry for 30 years. I was a satellite controller, space mission controller. I was the Russian integration manager for the space station and mission integration. Then I went off and worked uh, commercial satellites for about five years which was a very interesting uh, place to work after being in the NASA world for a long time. Went back and worked in CEV for the Boeing Northrop Grumman team. Then we lost, of course, so we quit doing that. And, um, and since then, I've worked all tear in a number of different commercial uh, kind of uh, activities. So, so I'll tell you a little bit about what Boeing's been doing for the past year or so, so on commercial. Uh, CF-100, there's a story behind how we came up with that. I guess I'll share it here. Um, everybody goes, that's a little technical. What happened was we asked to, to, to put together a video uh, on a very short notice for the president. So we had like three days to come up with a name. We called Chicago, and that's what they gave. So, so um, here we are. <laughs> I'll probably get in trouble for admitting that. But. So next chart. So what are we doing? I'll talk about the concept. A lot different than what, what John just showed. It's not a wing vehicle. It's a capsule. It's very similar to Apollo. And I'll tell you, there's goods and bads for wing vehicles and capsules. And there's a lot of debates. You can talk to anybody. And you can argue either side. I'm, I'm quite capable of arguing either side. And, and I will say that the, the, the reason that we went with a capsule versus a wing vehicle is just it was simpler and it would be quicker. But there's a lot of advantages to a wing vehicle. I don't want to say bad things about them. Uh, so what we're trying to do, we're trying to, to, to be 
very safe, very reliable, keep it low cost, low development risk. Uh, uh, we really believe that the fact that NASA doesn't have the capability or won't when shuttle shut down, the capability to put humans into space is a very Thing. We really believe at the Boeing Company that the gap should be as small as possible. So we really picked a, a design that we thought we could do as quickly as we possibly could do. Um, one of the things that's unique about this vehicle is we designed it to be compatible with a range of launch vehicles. I will apologize uh, to our ATK friends. We actually are looking at ATK as also a possible launch vehicle. I just didn't have it on this picture. My apologies. But you can see here there's a Dragon, a Delta, and an Atlas. Just make sure I was right. Falcon 9. Oh, sorry. Falcon 9. Dragon, competition. You're right. <laughs> hey, I saw it. It was in D.C. a couple days ago. It was really neat. Yeah. Uh, let's see. Operational 2015. I'll show you a schedule here in a second. And this is a key system. So we're doing the spacecraft. Uh, we're basically procuring the launch vehicle and integrating with the spacecraft. Uh, ground operation ops recovery. Uh, let's go to the next chart. So this is sort of, you know, nothing surprising here. Uh, you know, the launch vehicle, nor probably out of uh, Florida, no doubt. And we can go either to a space station or the Bigelow Aerospace Station, or Bigelow Space Complex is what they call it. Uh, we've been working with Bigelow for some time, working in spaces, as well as Bigelow supporting us on the contract, and I'll show you some of that later. So we're really trying to branch out for other customers on the space station. And as you see, some of the things that Boeing's done publicly, Talk to these adventures. We're looking at other potential platforms we might uh, visit. Uh, in order. Once it comes back, it lands with parachutes, very Apollo-like. But it, the difference is it lands on land, which I'll talk about a little bit later, I think. And then we reuse the capsule. We put a new service on it. We do it again. So that's pretty much the cycle. So what did we do the last year? We started a year and a half ago with that, that very crude thing looking over there in the corner. And we to a systems design review, uh, which is the design we have here. And uh, I guess I don't have a lot of charts on what the design concept is. I'll say a few things here uh, to give you an idea. There's one crew. Uh, it's got a capability of staying on orbit for about 48 hours. We decided to go a battery system versus solar because it was simpler, quite frankly. And as we went through and did our mission timelines, we realized uh, that was definitely uh, adequate uh, for what we're trying to do. We're simply going up to a, a platform on the platform, we take power from that platform, and then for 210 days.
here is where we did the hot fire about eight days ago out of the lobby. That was really interesting. I mean, we were 400 feet away from that thing, and it's about a 60,000-pound engine. And uh, that's the right way to say it. It felt like an earthquake. The earth definitely moved when they, when they fired that. The fire was about three and a half seconds. Uh, here we have our uh, avionics facility, and this is, uh, folks asked about what we're doing at JSC. We actually did this testing at JSC at the Arc Jet Test, and that was for our heat shield material. Next chart. Uh, some of the things we did at Big Aerospace, they built that mock-up for us. It's, we called it a boiler plate. And since we're landing on, on land, we have to have some kind of deceleration system when you hit. We're using airbags. They're actually the airbags that Orion had, and we basically adopted Brian them for weight, I believe, John may say. Yeah. And, but we don't have, we're not as weight constrained as they are. Same reason. They have to go all the way to the moon or Mars. We don't. It was the weight to Mars. Right. Weight to the moon. That was really driving. So, so, so it allowed us to go back and look at that, and they're actually the same, exact same airbags that Orion was going to use. And we tested those out at the space. <coughs> One of the other things that Apollo had to deal with was um, when you land in the ocean, and this would only be in an, an emergency, you can actually land upside down. You can flip upside down, and it'd be a little hard for the crew to get out. Okay. And so we actually we have some what we call uprighting bags, and you fill those up, and then it flips back up. Uh, let's see. Next chart. This is some of the mock-ups we did. Uh, you can see them. In fact, it's here in Houston at the HBSC. Anybody wants to see that, just give me a call. We'll, we'll go show it to you. Uh, here, I, this is uh, some of our Bigelow guys. This is actually Tommy Londrigan, but I thought. You know, he's really got the story Musgrave thing going, so we thought we'd use that picture. <laughs> Tommy will kill me when he sees that. Uh, next chart. Uh, why can we do this as, uh, as quickly as we can? Everybody thinks about Boeing being a very large, lethargic company. And really, the, the things that we've done is we've adapted a lot of uh, systems that we either already had or that other folks already had that we could use. Uh, we're taking the APAS docking system, although we are talking about, to NASA about the uh, common docking system, which is very similar. Our AR&D system, which is how you dock to the space station, is from an Orbital Express program that successfully worked about two years ago in orbit. So that we're not inventing anything there. Uh, the parachute system is exactly uh, like Apollo. So it's Heritage Apollo, and it's also leveraged off Orion's work. Um, Let's see what we got there. BLA is a, is a proprietary system that Boeing uses on other programs, so we've used it before. That's the, the base heat shield um, ablative system. And then the uh, structures are based off the Delta program, where we've been doing those kind of spin form structured for a year. And then uh, I already mentioned the airbag. Uh, next chart. So let's see, what's this chart say? So we've made a lot of progress. We, uh, yeah, right. Uh, we completed our system definition review in October. Um, it's a low-cost system. It's very simple. We're using existing technologies. Uh, we're going to go on proven launch vehicles. We're talking to all the launch vehicle providers as we speak. Um, I think, you know, you ask about some of the barriers, uh, or Cindy. You know, one of the barriers, of course, is that the way this is set up is it's a fixed-price development program, which is a big, big risk for anybody. Because as everybody knows, when you're trying to develop something new, there's a lot of things you don't understand, and so your costs can grow. So the biggest risk to us is are we going to sign up to a fixed-price contract uh, for development? And so, uh, but I think uh, in the end, uh, we've worked it up through our chain, and I think we're ready to go forward. We're hoping uh, in the next few weeks uh, we'll hear something from NASA as far as going forward with CC Dev 2. So that's all I got. Officially, no comment. <laughs> Thanks. And uh, next, uh, you know, from our one of our COTS partners is Orbital, Jeff Siders. I thought we were going down the row here. So, uh, I'm, okay. Uh, I'm Jeff Siders. Uh, real brief background: I've been in JSC area since uh, 1982. Uh, started at MacDAC and followed the shuttle program through most of my career in the flight design, flight dynamics, uh, mission control areas. And then uh, as the contract went from MACDAC to uh, Rockwell and USA, and then just recently went over to Orbital Sciences. So what I want to do today is just give you a little background on what Orbital's been doing. Uh, as Dennis mentioned, we've got uh, 
uh, COTS work. Go ahead and go to the next slide. So I'll give a little background on what, what Orbital is all about, what we're doing on COTS, and then what we've uh, put in for the commercial crew activity as well. Next slide. So a little bit about uh, Orbital. Uh, it's been around since 1982, uh, primarily in the field of satellites. Uh, it picked up the, the Delta II class type satellite work. Uh, and also launch vehicles. We have a facility down in Chandler, Arizona that does all our launch vehicle design. And I'll show you in a minute in the Dulles facility where we build a lot of satellites. So that's been uh, Orbital's core, core business. Uh, you can see we're at 3,600 employees, uh, a lot of backlog, a lot of work, and so far, so far things are going good. So next slide. These are our facilities. Uh, Dulles is where our headquarters is located, right outside Washington. Chandler, as I mentioned, is our launch vehicle development. We just acquired the satellite facilities in Gilbert, Arizona to kind of help uh, keep up with our satellite uh, building demand. And then we've got our technical folks, uh, services folks in uh, Greenbelt, Maryland. Next slide. Uh, so this is our uh, kind of overview of a satellite history since the early days. Uh, Orville's been involved in a lot of uh, foreign, national, DOD, NASA type satellite work over a number of years. Next slide. Uh, we're trying to build on that as we go forward. Uh, you can see our Pegasus is where we kind of started our, our niche uh, and doing, building off of that into Taurus, which we'll talk more, has been evolved to our Taurus II vehicle, which we're using now in our COTS uh, missions. Next slide. So a little bit about COTS and CRS. Next slide. This is our vehicle uh, we're designing right now. Uh, it's called Cygnus. I'll tell you a little bit more about the details of it. It's a uh, cargo resupply, carry roughly 2,000 kilograms to station. Next slide. So we started in uh, February 2008. Uh, we've got uh, one demonstration mission, hopefully going to fly later this year. We're shooting for the December time frame. Uh, we've got eight of the commercial resupply flights that'll occur between uh, 2011 to 2015. And we're making progress in all those areas, which I got another slide on, I'll show you. Oh, go ahead, next slide. So this is the components of our COT system. Over there on the uh, far left is our Cygnus vehicle. We involve cargo operations, mission operations, and our launch site operations with our Taurus II vehicle. We need to get this all to come together. Next slide. So the Cygnus vehicle itself, primarily have two components. We've got a, a service module there in the back end, which houses all the uh, nav sensors, uh, propellant systems, and whatnot. The front part here is your pressurized cargo module uh, being built by Alenia, who built the MPLMs for shuttle. <coughs> and a pressurized cargo capability. Next slide. A little bit more about the, uh, the PCM. We're using, a, as I mentioned, kind of the MPLM design. A smaller hatch than what they're used to on the station, but I uh, feel that fits all the NASA's needs of transferring cargo. Next slide. So what we're involved with is, as I mentioned, 2,000 kilograms of cargo. Uh, any kind of transfer bags that NASA wants to bring up, or even mid-deck payloads, uh, mid-deck lockers. Next slide. Uh, of course, we also have to deal with the trash. So our vehicles also will be stuffed with the trash and then burn up on re-entry. And this is our picture of our uh, Carl Walls, who's now with Orbital doing all our mission ops and cargo ops uh, work for the program. Next slide. This is where we'll be docked on station, node 2 Nader. Uh, we'll be grappled by the arm and then berthed to that port. Next slide. So where we are in some of the development, uh, we've got a few of our hardware coming together now, as I mentioned, toward a launch later this year. So we've got our PCM modules being built in Italy. Uh, we've had some cargo demos with the crew. Next slide. On the service module, it's being built in, in Dulles. And that's all being, the harnesses are being put in. Uh, all the other structural elements are coming together. Uh, on the launch vehicle side, next slide. This is our Taurus II vehicle. Uh, it's being built to, for a variety of missions. Uh, it can be launched out of Vandenberg or other, or other places. Out of, for the uh, COTS and CRS missions, we're gonna use Wallops as our launch site. So we're working with a lot of those folks to get a new, new launch infrastructure built to, to launch this rocket. Next slide. A little more detail about the rocket, two stage. Uh, we've got an ATK upper stage, Brian will talk about. Uh, 
Aerojets building our two HA-26 engines on the first stage. Next slide. So we've had a first delivery of the first stage from Usnoya in the Ukraine. Came over by barge, we got it loaded. <laughs> Went through the, the little towns there and get into the launch site. Uh, I think they were saying that that whole con or the truck was like over a football field long, getting this around all the, the streets and moving the power lines and things. So it was quite a quite a chore. Uh, so you can see it here, there in our uh, integration facility. Next slide. We've had some engine tests. We just had a recent one. I think it's been a couple weeks ago, about a 50 or 60 second uh, test. So those are all going well. Next slide. Uh, a little bit about our launch facilities there at Wallops. Uh, and also this is being, being built new in conjunction with NASA and the uh, Mid-Atlantic Regional Spaceport there in uh, Virginia. Next slide. Uh, buildings are coming together. Horizontal integration facility, the pad. Uh, launch tower there is, they say, the largest or tallest water tower in the East Coast or, or somewhere. So we're going to check and see if there's a Guinness World Record we can submit. But. Next slide. And this is kind of the graphic showing what it'll look like when it all comes together later this year. Next slide. So where we are in commercial crew, we're part of the, the CCDEV2 proposal that's going on. Uh, the vehicle we propose is a wing vehicle. Um, again, we want to focus on the safety aspects, the reusability aspects, uh, designed to carry uh, four to six crew. It, it's based on the work we've done in the past with NASA on the orbital space plane. Orbital was involved with that with NASA back in uh, 2000, 2003. So we're using that design to kind of again uh, fit the needs of NASA <coughs> transporting the uh, crew to the station. And I think that's all I have. All right. Thank you. First speaker who did not require the two-minute notice. <laughs> Very good. Good brownie points. All right. Another Jeff will now come up. Jeff Patton of United Launch Alliance. Here you go. Well, thanks for having me here. Uh, again, I'm Jeff Patton. I've got a lot of hats uh, for this uh, uh, panel. I said I'm manager of commercial crew and cargo uh, program within ULA, and, and that's just because I've kind of been... Uh, uh, enamored with that for many years and been working with a lot of the folks on the front row here and and uh, trying to make this happen uh, uh, so uh, who, who's you all or I guess I got to do my background my background is I actually started uh, working down here uh, with Jeff uh, many many years ago uh, uh, for McDonnell Douglas over here in the A B and C and D buildings and then uh, uh, joined uh, General Dynamics uh, soon after uh, the Challenger accident and, and uh, um, been uh, working Atlas Three and Atlas Five uh, launch vehicle development, and uh, uh, once we got those uh, vehicles flying, then uh, went off and started to do advanced programs like commercial crew. So that's kind of how I got to where I am. Um, so United Launch Alliance, who are we? Uh, we make Atlas and Deltas, Atlas Five and Delta Fours. Uh, I'm a I'm a Atlas Heritage guy, so uh, I have a little deference to Atlas over uh, over uh, Delta, but we love both our children the same. Uh, Maybe, maybe one a little bit more than the other, but uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, there's, there's a little video here. Uh, there's a little video here uh, kind of giving you background of what, what we do, and videos are better than me talking. ULA combines the talent and expertise of employees from Lockheed Martin and Boeing to create the best launch vehicles in the world. Atlas and Delta vehicles have launched critical government and civilian payloads for decades with an amazing track record of mission success. Now these two very successful teams are joining together to form United Launch Alliance. Ignition of the main engine. And now ignition of the solid rocket motors. We have liftoff. Lift off of a Delta II rocket carrying NROL-21 for the National Reconnaissance Office. This also marks the first mission for United Launch Alliance. So that, that's uh, one of the first videos we made under ULA uh, to kind of give a background on, on who we are and where we came from and what we do. We do Atlas V, Delta IV, and uh, uh, Delta IIs. And uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about those uh, in the next slide, I think. Um, Atlas and Delta for crew launch. 
Uh, we have the capability with both our systems of vehicles, Atlas V and Delta IV, uh, to launch all the uh, crew spacecraft currently planned or in development. We work closely with everybody here on the, on the uh, uh, front row to try to make that vision happen. Uh, uh, you can see some of the vehicles we're working on. We can also uh, uh, do Orion. We're, we're hopeful that uh, we'll have the opportunity to launch it. Uh, we're working very closely uh, with, uh, with Lockheed to help make that happen. So, so we feel that uh, with the demonstrated reliability that, uh, that uh, our launch vehicles bring uh, to bear, that we can really get those, uh, these vehicles launched as, as quickly as possible and, and uh, to uh, uh, get folks back on orbit after the shuttle retires. Um, so far, the uh, EELV program, uh, that's the Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle Program, that's the Atlas V and Delta, v, uh, Delta IV uh, uh, launch vehicles uh, perform under that contract. We've had 38 launches to date. All of those have been successful. 24 have been Atlas Vs and 14 are Delta IVs. And uh, we're very proud of that uh, uh, history of mission success. Uh, we've also had 94 consecutive Atlas successes since 1994, and that's uh, Atlas IIs, Atlas uh, III's, and Atlas Vs. So we're very very proud of that, um, but it's something we watch uh, uh, extremely closely because in the launch business, you're only as good as your last uh, success, and, and uh, for those of us that have been through failures, it's, it's not fun, and, and so we, uh, we have a culture that uh, uh, is very focused on mission success. Next chart, please. This shows all the uh, ELV launches. Um, uh, when you look at it in, in its total of all the 38, it, it's quite a few missions. Uh, there's a mix of all different uh, vehicle configurations in there of Atlas uh, Fives, uh, without solids, uh, with solids. Same with the, on the Delta side. There are Delta IV heavies in here as well. Um, you can see these down here. And if you go to the next chart, uh, you can focus in on our last heavy launch, the NRL NROL 49, which was launched uh, out of Vandenberg. Uh, it was the first launch for a Delta IV heavy uh, out of Vandenberg, and it was the largest uh, launch vehicle that's ever launched uh, out of uh, Vandenberg. And uh, if you saw the video, it was a very spectacular launch, and uh, uh, we're very pleased with that. Next chart, please. Um, how are we going to fly people on our vehicles? Uh, you know, for years we've kind of heard that you couldn't do it on, uh, on ELV. Uh, uh, we're really never, not quite sure how that uh, came to be, because uh, 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 as we've been going down the path of offering crew launch, uh, we feel pretty uh, confident that our vehicles uh, are reliable enough uh, to offer a, a safe uh, uh, safe uh, launch vehicle for crew. Um, our uh, uh, development history and heritage and demonstrated reliability is probably the key thing. Uh, you know, one of the things we kind of tell everybody is, is the Air Force and NRO, and NRO especially, has never, seen, has never seen a reliability upgrade they didn't like. So our vehicles are about as reliable as they can be without actually degrading uh, reliability by adding uh, extra redundancy and things like that. So, so we're, we're kind of at a, at a, at a point where uh, you can add a whole bunch of money, get a whole bunch of additional uh, uh, systems on board, but it really ends up degrading reliability. So, so we really think that the fact that, that we have uh, about the best reliability you can get now, uh, demonstrated reliability in conjunction with that, because we're going to be flying these same vehicles, same, same Atlas Vs and Delta IVs that we fly today are going to be the same ones you fly for crew. So you get to prove out those systems on an on-crewed basis, and that really uh, adds to your confidence and, and is really the right thing to do. Um, uh, we will also leverage the history we have with NASA certification. Uh, for example, our Atlas V, and this isn't uh, the Atlas V hugging, uh, but we are uh, Category 3 certified in the uh, NASA, uh, or for the NASA Launch Services Program to launch the, uh, the nation's most uh, complicated uh, and critical NASA uh, spacecraft, like Pluto, for example. Um, so uh, uh, we would use that same process um, and leverage that to uh, ensure that we have uh, uh, human certification <coughs> plus whatever other requirements that NASA will come up with. Um, uh, the design implementation, obviously, it's important to use uh, flight-proven uh, uh, vehicles to go out and do that. That's why it's important here early on as we're trying to, uh, to get the crew launch uh, capability going again is using that, uh, that uh, flight-proven design. Uh, the only, there's only two things that we would have to add to our systems to get them to launch a crew. The first is the emergency detection system, which monitors the vehicle and tells you uh, the health and status of the vehicle and when uh, you're going to have a problem, and then tell the uh, spacecraft it's time to go. Um, we did uh, that work, and I'll talk about that on the next chart, during CCDEV-1. Uh, we hope to continue that uh, in CCDEV-2. Uh, and then, right now, we don't have a way to get people in and out at the pad. Uh, so those are kind of the two things, EDS and ingress and emergency egress are the two things that we really have to add to the system uh, to make our, uh, our, our vehicles uh, uh, human certified. Now, one of the things that we did during CCDEV2 
uh, or CC Dev 1, um, was uh, uh, we uh, did some testing at the NASTAR facility up in, uh, it's outside of Philadelphia, I believe, um, where we uh, gave them a, uh, uh, an ascent trajectory uh, and the acceleration profiles. And then we uh, had uh, Jeff Ashby, uh, who uh, uh, a former astronaut, uh, to actually get in there and experience those, uh, those G levels and kind of see what he could do uh, operationally to see whether it, he's, to see <laughs> to see whether, <laughs> to see whether uh, uh, he could really operate because we do up in this simulation on an Atlas uh, 5402, uh, we do go up to about four Gs. So we kind of wanted to see whether he was still able to uh, uh, f function. Uh, with a typical uh, Atlas V uh, ascent trajectory. Uh, so you'll see in this video, you'll see him over on the uh, right-hand side, my right, your left, um, to uh, kind of show what he's experiencing. He'll have a little narration in the upper, uh, upper right-hand side over here. Uh, you'll see uh, uh, the acceleration curve and kind of where he is on that. And then down here, you'll see a little animation of the events that are going on. So we just kind of wanted to see whether, whether uh, a human could actually uh, 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 handle the accelerations that we were uh, uh, seeing in a typical uh, uh, ascent. Uh, one thing you'll notice, uh, uh, our video folks kind of refer to this as the Blair Witch Project uh, video, because it is in black and white, and, and, and if you'll notice, and I'm just telling you this ahead of time, you'll notice that his eyes are very white, and, and the NASTAR folks use that because their medical folks do some analysis based on eye movement and, and uh, some other characteristics of the eye, so, so you'll see that they're highlighted, but that they're, so there's a reason for that. Uh, it's not just kind of a scary looking video, so. Okay. 
second stage ignition. Okay, and I'm feeling fine, by the way. I'm just describing some things. <laughs> Very easy. This is a good good time. After there's a going to be a recovery period of 10 or 15 seconds after that Miko, I think, until you can function again. But this is the time to function. I'm feeling pretty normal right now. It's kind of fun to watch that because, you know, obviously when the G levels went down, that uh, was a little unexpected on his part. Uh, <laughs> um, next chart, please. Uh, for, and I'll go fast, Dennis. Uh, for CC Dev 1, uh, we did the EDS prototype development where we did the hardware, software, uh, developed the algorithms to go out and do some simulated abort testing. We looked at four different cases. Uh, uh, two of them were things that happened pretty darn quick to make sure that our system could. Um, assess those and, and give the signal and then a couple of, of slow situations like where you had leaks um, or you had systems that degraded slowly uh, and in all cases uh, the algorithms and the, the data we sent worked fine so um, that was uh, that was obviously very, something we're very uh, proud of. Next chart please. Um, so how, what, what do we need uh, some help with from JSC? You know we, we haven't interfaced a whole lot with JSC uh, in the past couple years but we see that change in a whole lot. Uh, because there's a lot of things that the, the JSC uh, folks have that uh, uh, a lot of experience that, that we really want to tap into. The human system certification, safety and mission assurance uh, from a human perspective, uh, ascent trajectory design, uh, human system integration, PRAs, everybody loves PRAs. Um, so that's something that we really need some help with, uh, 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 especially from a human uh, standpoint. Next chart, please. So um, as a summary chart, uh, we think uh, uh, our existing systems offer a pretty straightforward way, a pretty straightforward approach for a crew launch. Uh, flight proven systems demonstrate reliability is key, especially here in the near term. Um, uh, we think there's minimal development effort for human space flight, and we have made uh, significant progress on uh, EDS during CCDev2, and we hope to expand that uh, uh, in the near future. That's all I have. Thank you, Jeff. Again, keep, uh, keep some questions in mind. We have two more presentations. I appreciate your patience, and we'll have uh, some time for your for Q&A afterward. So our next speaker is uh, Brian Duffy of AETK. Liberty. Hey, what's up? The Liberty. Yeah, the Liberty, the one-pager on, on the left. Uh, did you just want the one? Yeah, yeah. Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be able to join you. Um, uh, as was mentioned, my name is Brian Duffy. and um, been here at the Johnson Space Center on and off since 1985. Um, had the great pleasure of uh, flying four space missions on the, the space shuttle, that incredible machine that you heard everyone talking about here, the thing that can uh, carry 25 tons to orbit, bring 25 tons home, um, roars out of the atmosphere, uh, dances on orbit, flies like a dream, and then roars back into the, into the atmosphere. And, uh, lands on a runway. Amazing, amazing vehicle. Um, I retired out of the uh, Air Force, left the astronaut office in 2001 and joined Lockheed Martin at the time. Went down to the Kennedy Space Center and was down there for a few years. Um, because of my Air Force background from, from before that and my flight experience uh, in, in space, they said, um, you know, you understand the military, you understand space, how about if you come up here and help us with this military space stuff that we've got going on in Colorado. So I lived in Colorado for about uh, five years. Uh, and then they said, well, we looked around the corporation and uh, got 140,000 people and only one of them has ever flown anything in space. So how would you like to go to, back to Houston uh, and be the Altair program manager? And so I was going to do the same thing with that, that Keith uh, was doing. And, uh, you, of course, we all know that story. Um, so I, was, uh, I, I retired from Lockheed Martin after uh, nearly 10 years with them uh, on January 31st, just recently. And on February 1st, I started with ATK. So I'm learning how to spell ATK at this point. Um, my first day on the job, they said, um, oh, by the way, there's a space up Houston. It's a week from Saturday. We already RSVP'd that, we, that we're going to have a presenter, and you're it. I said, well, that's, that, that's nice, but uh, what am I to present? And I said, well, that's your problem. You know, you can do that. Well, so very fortunate. Uh, I'm very fortunate that um, just earlier this week, uh, they came out with a press release announcing some things that have been going on uh, in, over the last year um, that I'm happy to be able to share with you here today. 
And uh, the, the project or the plan is something called the Liberty Launch System. Uh, I'm only going to have one slide because uh, it, it's, um, it's that fresh. We don't have pictures of anything. Um, but our plan uh, is to take the solid rocket, the redesigned solid rocket motor that, uh, from the, the shuttle, only make, instead of being a four segment, it'll be the five segment version uh, that's been worked on in the Ares 1 program within Constellation. Use that as the first stage. Take the um, core stage from the Ariane 5, which is amazingly similar to, in dimensions and in performance to what was going to be planned uh, in the Ares program. And it's pretty much just a drop-in uh, system to, to um, be the uh, second stage. And so we'll be taking uh, essentially two mostly human rated, of course the, the solid rocket boosters are human rated, we fly people on them all the time, and we've flown 200, I think the number says 215 consecutive uh, successful missions, and then we're going to take the core stage of Ariane 5 that was originally designed to fly the Hermes, so they were designing that stage um, to be human rated uh, when the Hermes program was canceled and then they stopped doing that. So there's a little bit of work left to do in human rating um, that, uh, but it's clearly doable uh, for us. So take those, those two um, essentially human rating, rateable systems, put them together and provide a safe uh, transportation system to get crews to orbit. We can lift um, about 44,500 pounds, so we'll have, be able to lift um, um, any of the vehicles that are contemplated right now and being designed. There are not, it's the uh, rocket, um, the launch system will actually kind of scratches a lot of itches, if you would. You know, there, um, um, the national space policy has uh, said that we're going to have a, um, more international cooperation, and this is certainly uh, one way uh, to do that. Uh, we think that um, it'll help a lot in transitioning the workforce from the shuttle era to the, <clears throat> to the next era uh, in the commercial world. Uh, it will be, we're planning to use the, uh, the VAB and the pads down at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, so we'll be able to use the, uh, be able to leverage all of the money that's been um, invested over the years. Uh, in the program, so we're very excited about it. Um, uh, right now, it's as I said, it's just a one slide. The, the uh, ink's still a little bit wet uh, on it, but but it has an awful lot of promise for being a, a, a great system for uh, carrying any of the vehicles to the International Space Station, and the ISS is the uh, focus uh, for for this. So I look forward to your questions later. Thanks. Not bad for just a few days on the job. I'm very <laughs> impressed, very impressed. Okay, uh, last but not least is uh, SpaceX. Uh, Ken Bowersox is representing our other COTS partner. And uh, take it away, Sox. Yeah, well, I, I've lived here in the Clear Lake area since 1987. The, um, NASA assigned me to the Johnson Space Center uh, in the astronaut office. I uh, had the fortune to fly on five orbital missions, four of them based off of the space shuttle and one based off of the, the space station. Um, my last assignment there was as the director of flight crew operations where I was responsible for the astronaut office and all the flight operations at the Johnson Space Center. Um, when I decided to retire from the Navy about four years ago, um, I. Uh, thought, hey, it's time to, to look outside of NASA and see what else uh, is available. So uh, I, I, I stepped out uh, from the government sector. Um, and then uh, spent a couple years kind of stepping back into the government sector as a, a consultant on review boards for the Constellation program uh, until I joined uh, SpaceX about a year and a half ago. Um, uh, SpaceX uh, is a growing company. When I uh, first started with them, uh, there were 650 employees. Now we've got over 1,200. We've got three major sites 
uh, a large production and manufacturing facility. Well, it's large for us. It's about 550,000 square feet. Uh, they used to build 747 uh, fuselage sections inside the plant, the Northrop company did. Uh, but uh, Northrop uh, left the plant, the plant was empty, and, and we took it over. Uh, we've also got a test site up in McGregor, Texas, where we test all of our engines and uh, major structures for the uh, uh, Falcon 9 and Dragon and, and the Merlin engines. Uh, plus, we do full integrated stage tests of the vehicles up there in McGregor, uh, roughly 150 people there, 1,000 in Hawthorne, and then another uh, 100 or so at our main launch site in Cape Canaveral. We're also developing launch sites at Vandenberg Air Force Base. We have a small launch site uh, out in Kwajalein, and we've got some uh, liaison offices in Washington, D.C., Huntsville, Alabama, and we're planning to open one here in Houston. It's, it's not going to have uh, a lot of opportunities for uh, people in the Houston area to work for SpaceX in Houston, but we'll probably have four to, to ten slots there. Uh, next slide. Um, I like to show this in all my presentations just because uh, people are uh, sometimes amazed that we have a quality policy at SpaceX. Uh, part, part of the reputation of the company is that, that we do things uh, very quickly and um, aren't typically uh, burdened by bureaucracy. Uh, but, but this is something we believe in. It, it's uh, part of our ISO and AS9100 uh, certification. Uh, and uh, it, it shows that we're interested in not just providing cheap vehicles, uh, inexpensive vehicles, lowering the cost of access to space, all those things. Uh, what we want to do is provide the safest and most reliable uh, and economical access to space. And the, the first part of that is the, the safe part. Next slide. Um, this is how we, we do business. We could talk about this for a long time, so I won't get into all the, pie all the pieces. But um, you, you've seen this approach uh, a lot of other places. In fact, uh, when I talk to folks who work in Apollo, they tell me this is what they did. Uh, next slide. Um, these are our three main uh, products right now. The Falcon 1, our trainer rocket, it's got one Merlin engine on it, can carry roughly 800 pounds into low Earth orbit. It's launched five times. The first three times uh, were partial successes. We got a little bit higher each, uh, each launch, uh, trained our team, uh, uh, expanded our, our processes. Uh, the fourth launch, we made it uh, into orbit. The fifth launch, we launched a paying customer and their satellites up there working great right now, taking pictures of the Earth. Uh, the Falcon 9 uh, is uh, the follow-on to the Falcon 1. It's got nine Merlin engines on the bottom and then a vacuum version of the Mer Merlin engine on the second stage. Uh, it can carry roughly um, 20,000 kilograms into low Earth orbit. Uh, a little more, a little less, depending on, on what inclinations you go into. And then the Dragon um, should ride on top of a Falcon 9 uh, uh, to the space station pretty soon. Um, it was designed uh, to carry cargo to the International Space Station first, then hopefully someday cruise. Next slide. Um, the Falcon 9 has flown twice. The first flight was last June uh, with uh, an inert upper stage, uh, an inert dragon on the top. Um, the, uh, the flight was uh, uh, very successful, at least it accomplished all of our major success criteria and hit its uh, insertion parameters pretty closely. Um, and then we launched again in December. Next slide. Um, we've got quite a few customers manifested, uh, uh, both um, commercial satellite type launches and, uh, and launches for the U.S. government. Of course, the CRS contract, the Commercial Resupply Services contract, is our biggest contract. It's about $1.6 billion for 12 launches, 20,000 kilograms to the International Space Station. Next slide. Um, planned development for the Falcon 9 is to upgrade the engines uh, make it a little bit bigger uh, to carry uh, carry more with the expanded single core vehicle and then go to a triple core vehicle. Um, next slide. Uh, the Dragon spacecraft um, has a lot of potential missions uh, from carrying cargo to the space station uh, to carrying crews someday, but there's also a, a really interesting mission called the Dragon Lab, Lab where we would put payloads inside the vehicle, uh, send them up for a couple years on orbit, and, uh, and do microgravity science or other Earth observation or uh, whatever type uh, satellite uh, science we wanted to do with satellites in the trunk. Next slide. Uh, this is an idea for what the Dragon looks like. Uh, the major components are the, the nose cap, the pressurized section, and the trunk uh, on, on the back. The trunk is uh, uh, something that really expands the capability of the vehicle because you can put all kinds of great stuff there, just like the trunk of your car. 
Um, and uh, to make the vehicle more reusable, we have a donut-shaped service section just uh, below the, the major part of the pressurized section so we can bring back the, the tanks and maneuvering thrusters. Next slide. This gives you a feel for the, uh, the dimensions of the vehicle. Um, and uh, typically we're looking at uh, 3,000 kilograms or so in the pressurized volume, uh, possibly 25,000 or 2,500 kilograms down. Uh, but, but those are maximum numbers. Uh, we're really volume limited, so uh, it, it would be less than that. We have to do roughly 1,700 kilograms of flight to meet the requirements for the, the CRS contract. Next slide. Uh, the big thing that we do that other um, vehicles don't do right now is uh, return stuff to Earth from the space station. Uh, that, that's a unique capability of the Dragon. Next slide. Um, the, the first demo mission for the Commercial Orbital Transportation Services Space Act Agreement uh, happened uh, first week in December last year. Uh, the start of the second week was December 8th, I believe, something like that, uh, where we uh, launched uh, a, a simplified version of the Dragon uh, to do um, one and a half laps around the Earth, a uh, li little less than two, but when it finally landed. Um, launched out of Florida, uh, landed just off the west coast of California. Um, it, the major objectives were to test out the heat shield, test out the orbital guidance navigation control, uh, test out the, the thrusters in space, uh, and, and all that went very well. Uh, parachutes opened just like they were supposed to, splash down. Uh, we had a barge stationed not too far from the landing area. They pulled the spacecraft aboard, and this is what it looked like uh, out uh, there when we, when we pulled it in. Uh, it, it looked like we could have just uh, pumped up the tanks and flown it again if we had another Falcon 9 ready to go. Next slide. Um, uh, after we fly the C3 mission and uh, go up to the station, get grabbed by the robot arm and berth, all the uh, follow-on CRS missions uh, will be pretty much similar. They'll look like this. Next slide. <coughs> and then uh, if we uh, uh, get uh, the capability to carry crew, which I, I think should happen um, reasonably soon, um, the missions would look like this, where we, where we dock instead of using the robot arm to grab us and, and pull us into the station. Next slide. Uh -huh. um, the, uh, the Dragon, when it's modified to carry crew, uh, should carry about seven. It'll be a little bit of a, a tight ride, kind of like coach seats uh, heading across the Atlantic, but uh, it should be a short trip. Next slide. Um, SpaceX was founded to carry crew, so we've thought about it from day one. These are the three things that we need to do to Dragon to fit crew inside it. Uh, we need to uh, develop a launch escape system or a launch abort system. Uh, we need to put in uh, seats, displays, and life support systems for a crew. We think that would take us about three years from the time we get started. Uh, and a lot of people say, hey, that's very aggressive. How could you do that in three years? Well, it's important to remember that we've been doing this since the company was founded. So uh, we've been we're thinking about crew. It, it was the reason the company started in the first place. So we've actually got an eight-year start. And if you add up eight years and three, that's really more like 11, which is a, a, a pretty reasonable number, I think. Next slide. Uh, happy to take questions uh, when the time comes. Outstanding. Um, I think what we're going to do is uh, seat our panel um, facing the audience. We actually have some chairs. Um, and we're going to take some questions. And uh, how much time do we have left in the... We can go to 915. 915. So we have like about 20 minutes. So uh, I can't see anything because of the lights. But so uh, raise your hand and yell if you have a question while we're getting situated. Uh, thanks. Yeah, and, and you all get to sit. Good. Come on. You get to be in the spotlight. Yeah, don't be don't be bashful. Okay, yeah. Lady in the back. Do we need, need a mic for the the questioners? Okay, just just yell. Okay. Oh we do, okay, hold on, we are gonna use mics. Sorry. Okay. Okay. All right, there you go. Um this is for the folks who are working on uh, crew vehicles coming down the line. Um the mic is not Okay, never mind. Um, I was just wondering if you guys have kind of started thinking about what the division of responsibility will be for crew training and um, operations once you get started between 
you guys' company and NASA. Okay. Who wants to take a stab at that? Crew training. So you, you just want to know how we're planning to do crew training and operations? Okay, well, I'll answer first, and then I think Sox and others can go into it. Obviously, me having that background, that's one of the jobs that, that I've got. Um, we're going to be drop testing the first vehicle to land on a runway next year, so I've got I to head into that pretty quick. Um, so we're going to start with what we're going to do with the test pilots and how do you get them trained. You want to start with somebody that's good. Uh, so you'd start with the test pilots. You wouldn't take somebody off the street. And so we're already working through that. A number of simulators that we will have on the ground. We're even discussing whether we'd want to have aircraft like the shuttle trainer aircraft um, to be used for that. So that's already in work. For the orbital missions, um, it'd be probably similar to what you're talking about, where we would have both training of crews and flight controllers. Probably going to do it a little bit differently than the way I was used to. I probably will take the guys that um, did the design and development of the vehicle and then put them in, turn them into flight controllers, assuming I can make sure that, that uh, they're able to make quick decisions fast. So already working along those lines. Mission control is going to be executed out of here, at least, at least that's my goal. Uh, working Space Act agreements to see if we can do that, assuming the price point makes sense. That's a lot of the issues that we're trying to work with on the, on the government side, is whether we can not have to pay for the infrastructure cost of that kind of thing, and if they're already using it you know, for space station and for the Orion missions and those kind of things, then maybe we can just lease the space and be done there. But I can do it from other places as well. Did I answer your question? I think a similar thing. I think the, the real question, crew training is, is whose crew are we flying, right, is probably one of the, one, one of the questions, right? And so the, the, we have initially said our first test pilots may be Boeing, similar to what we've done on, on commercial airplane, but later, particularly for a NASA mission, uh, to ISS, obviously they'll all be NASA or, or maybe commercial crew going up. So our plan is to to have our team train that crew, uh, but they would be NASA crews. So for that, in that particular case, the the commander would be a NASA person that we would train. Uh, as far as training the flight controllers, we're doing a very similar thing. Things we did back in the in the satellite days, we actually used our engineers, our development engineers, as mission controllers because it's typically a short mission, and so you don't have them uh, as all the time like you had on the shuttle or station mission. So that's our plan today. Of course, we will be flexible uh, depending on what our customers want. So uh, a lot of it depends on what our customers ask for. Yeah, and that's the real answer is what the customers want is what we'll probably provide. Um, but I can tell you that uh, it can be done very inexpensively. And if you want to look at a low-cost model for, for training crews, uh, look at what the Russians do. Uh, it's incredibly lean what they get away with. <laughs> and from an orbital perspective, we're kind of in line with what's been said before. We're in a, we have a capability we have from our, our own uh, satellite operations control we do in Dulles, uh, but we're going to look for a partnership with NASA here locally to do that kind of work for a crewed mission. Um. Where's the mic? Oh, yeah, for right here. <laughs> okay. I want to thank you all for being here. I hope this is the beginning of many discussions that we have uh, with the commercial uh, industry and all the expertise we have here, especially when we think about uh, um, crewed missions uh, in commercial space. So I, I hope that the, we'll have many opportunities to, to speak with you all and uh, get the best use of all these new and exciting capabilities with all the expertise uh, that, that we've shown here at Johnson Space Center over time. As far as impediments, I mean, beyond the obvious economic ones, uh, there, there will be organizations that will, are going to try to help ensure that these things can come together. If you could think of one or two main impediments, I mean, at the national level, at the state level, where your companies to operate in this commercial environment, what would they be? There's you know, third party liability issues, FA promulgating regulations, there's, there's a whole raft of bumps have been put in your way. What, what are the ones still remaining? How can we help you smooth out the ones that are still there? Um, of course, there are a lot of impediments, and, and you mentioned the first one. The first one is the business case. Uh, you know, these are all companies, and companies have to make a profit or they won't survive. So it has to be a business case that will close, and the biggest uncertainty in the business case 
uh, not only is it NASA and where they're headed, but it's also the commercial market, and, and will, it, will it expand or not? Uh, you know, the companies have made, made bets on that before and lost those bets, uh, but I think things are changing very rapidly, and I think one of the things that uh, uh, the administrator just said a couple days ago, that he is essentially ceding to the, the lower Earth orbit market to commercial companies is, is a big deal. And so if that's uh, where NASA and the government are headed, I think that really helps the companies go forward and make some commitments to, to, to do business in low-Earth orbit. Yeah, Keith did a good job of I think probably that's, that's the primary one. And, and me being an old NASA guy, a lot of us are old NASA guys, um, the, probably the hardest one, former, former. <laughs> I'm old too, but the... the is, is how invasive the, uh, the oversight and insight type models will end up being when we get done. And I know there's a lot of uh, discussions going on at higher levels on how, how we can do that. Because to close the business case, you've know, you got to make sure that, that you allow the, the company, especially fixed price contracts, because I think a number of us, I might not have said it, but fixed price contracts is a big deal. Um, you know, so if you're committing that you're going to do something on a particular date and time, then you've got to be given some latitude to, to figure out how to uh, make schedule. And sometimes when that makes schedule, it doesn't mean it's not going to be safe. You know, you can do stuff, and there's a lot using Jeff Patton's analogy. We launch a lot of payloads on top of the, that rocket. So, you know, those kind of things have to be worked through. And I'm talking about human rating and those kind of things. So we're, we're still, it's a give and take, and uh, I think that's one of those that we'll have to, you know, come to agreement on. And I'll just, um, just kind of piggyback on that. And that the contracting method is a real... Uh, could be a real impediment for us. You know, a fixed price development contract uh, is s something that's pretty hard to sell to a board of directors out there, and there's a, you know, a significant amount of risk that, that you have to be able to deal with. So um, I would put that way up near the top of my list for impediments. Uh. Um, for, for me, I, when I look at the, the things that could stop what's going on in the commercial world. Uh, it's the, the thought that we're um, competing with established programs. Uh, you know, uh, a lot of people uh, a year or so ago, um, when um, Constellation was uh, under threat, started uh, throwing a lot of rocks at the commercial programs, uh, trying to make uh, them look impossible uh, as a way to keep Constellation going. And, and people forgot that when the vision for space exploration came out, um, it had two parts. Uh, one part was what became Constellation. The other part was to encourage commercial. Uh, but th that sort of got forgotten, and, uh, and, and, and the attack <coughs> happened. And, and the commercial guys were attacking Constellation, and the Constellation guys were attacking commercial. And we were so busy fighting each other, we, we really came close to losing our space program altogether. Uh, and I don't think the threat's gone. Uh, and I think probably what's uh, most important now is figuring out how we work together to take the best of, of all the different um, possibilities that are out there to start focusing on what we're going to do with them and, uh, and moving out to, to explore. Um, from a ULA perspective and a, and a Jeff Patton perspective, we need people to make decisions and to move out. We're, we're spending too much time, and, and kind of what Ken's saying, we're, we're spending too much time churning and churning and, and we need people to make decisions and start moving out because we're wasting time we're all getting older <laughs> we're all getting older and nothing's happening that's not what, that's that's what none of us want we want to move out there, there's plenty of stuff out there you know if commercial crew can go to leo and iss fabulous let's get going we can get orion going to exo leo get it going fast we, we got to get people making decisions to move out it's killing us it's killing our it's killing our business because uh, of the indecision, we, we can't forecast what's going to happen in a year or two or three to be able to make sound business decisions. We, we need somebody to make decisions. E even if they don't fall in our favor for whatever reason, it, it, it helps us make decisions on what we're going to do going forward. But make some decisions and let's get on with it. Yeah, I, I have to ditto everything that's been said here. Of course, we're, business case is our primary concern. Uh, this is a long-term investment, an expensive investment. There has to be a, uh, a long-term look at this to make it worthwhile. Uh, there are some hurdles with FAA or <coughs> third-party liability that have to be addressed along the way, but uh, really it's looking at the long-term. 
the uh, dealing with NASA has been working fine with us so, so far in the COTS world. As we move into commercial crew, there's going to be a little bit more of a uh, relationship that has to be worked out there between insight, oversight, requirements. There's a lot of NASA requirements out there that need to be better organized so we know what we're designing to, uh, to make an efficient, safe vehicle uh, to make them happy. Hey guys, questions from the internet. Uh, Fax wanted to know. Um, sorry, give me a second to scroll back up for that one. For, former shuttle program manager Wayne Hale and others have described blackout phases during ascent for crew on EELVs. How is this being addressed? <coughs> Yeah, I'm a, kind of familiar with that. Um, it, it, there are none as far as we can tell. That's been one of those urban myths. Uh, I refer to it as an urban myth that's been around for years. Um, for, for any of our vehicles, uh, we, we can't seem to find any. So I, I, you know, I don't know where it came from. Um, well, I shouldn't say that. We, we, we kind of understand what the genesis was, but we, we could never recreate it based on our data. So for, and that's, that's across our whole fleet. So there, there, are, there are none that we're aware of. Um, from a, and, and the, the, the performance impact uh, for designing, for shaping the trajectory to, to close uh, 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 black zones is very minimal. Um, so I'll, I'll just, I'll just kind of leave it at that. Um, just recently we have uh, started working with the NASA JSC folks to understand uh, what trajectory constraints they were using for the Orion program to make sure that, that the basis of, of that statement is true and fortunately, we, you know, based on our technical interchange, uh, we've been designing to the same parameters. Uh, there, there really isn't any difference. So, so we, we feel very confident that we can, uh, we can shape our trajectories to eliminate black zones and not have a big performance impact. And just real quick, just to reiterate what Jeff just said, you know, for the Dream Chaser specifically, we had looked, you know, during CCDEV 1 at the Atlas V and the Dream Chaser and there were no black, there are no black zones. We have cross-range capability to get on a runway no matter where the abort does occur through that trajectory and, and got a lot of data to back that up. And so what Jeff just said, I know works for, for our spacecraft. We've got a lot of capability there. A black zone is really a, a combination of the capability of the, of the spacecraft on top of the launch vehicle and the launch vehicle. And all of the providers here are working to make sure there are no black zones in their design. So basically my understanding of black zone is a case where you cannot safely abort. And, and I think everybody's working to make sure that's not the case. And it's one of the basic fundamental design constraints that we're using. So there will be no black zones. There was another question from Jeppif. He wanted to know, uh, in regards to Liberty, is that going to be a four-segment solid rocket booster or a five-segment solid rocket booster? Yeah, it's going to be the five-segment uh, so solid there. Yeah, it's going to look... Um, uh, a lot like the Ares 1X uh, tested, it's going to be a little bit, um, uh, a little, just slightly different in dimensions, but uh, uh, a lot of the flight test data that we got from Ares 1X uh, will be directly applicable and, and usable for um, part of the Liberty programs. So. Right, we'll hand, Internet will hand it back. Internet out. Internet, uh, how about San Diego? Do they have questions? Actually, I have a question. Okay, go. So, um, the gentleman from ATK, you guys released your press release just so you could present here at Space Up. Is that not true? <laughs> it, it shows just how powerful you are. I didn't know. Yeah, I, I think didn't that's, know. That's where Cindy wanted you to go, I think. Yeah. Um, does anybody else have questions? Yeah, actually, I'm, I'm going to. I'm going to. Um, the moderator is going to interject one. Ooh, um, the moderator has We are here in Texas. And, uh, in fact, I, Wayne, I was expecting you to ask this question, but uh, um, what is the impact, you know, there's a lot of concern about jobs, you know, um, through government contracting or the commercial approach. Um, what comments can you state in general about, you know, jobs doing things commercially um, and in Texas? Because uh, you know, Wayne's involved in the Texas Space Alliance, and so there's a lot of interest in jobs in Texas. Any, any comments? On well, the commercial I, approach. Well, I'll have the mic and then I'll pass, pass it on. Um, 
Uh, li Liberty would probably not have uh, an increase in jobs in Texas. However, it would protect uh, up to 200 jobs down in Florida and then ultimately add another 100 is what we're projecting on down there. So it would be 300 jobs, but they'd be down at the Cape where we plan to launch from. So. I, I guess I'd have to say right now our team is probably 30% space shuttle folks. So, so when space shuttle is shut down, a significant number of our team will be folks, uh, for the most part, that our current Boeing employees work in space shuttle will be working um, CST-100. So as far as most of that design will be done here, uh, as where we plan to build it, we're still looking at various options, uh, but definitely a lot of jobs here in Houston. Yeah, and I'll speak it in two different ways. In terms of we're, we're hiring right now, obviously, because we're staffing up for the full for the full program. And a lot of the skills that Keith just talked about from the shuttle program, you know, we have been looking. You, you've, you know, it's a winged vehicle. It has basically the same characteristics, you know, the same thermal protection system, the same kind of processing. We are looking to the Kennedy Space Center stuff. All the flight dynamics are very similar. So we are already looking at the skill basis for that kind of thing. It's in two phases, though. We are going to be building the vehicle in Colorado, and then we're going to be doing the, uh, the execution out of here. I mentioned earlier about the leveraging of stuff that we are doing with the Johnson Space Center as well. Um, for example, the GNC work that we were talking about, there's a number of other facilities and capabilities that are done here. And the cool thing about these Space Direct agreements, they're in reverse, where basically you can buy a service. I know Keith already did that. Um, through the last program, I think he was showing you the ArcJet work that they did out of Johnson. We're doing the same thing. So that kind of work is going on as well, uh, and we want it to continue. So this is the, a new relationship here with, with signing of these umbrella agreements that allow you to do tasks for here. Um, we will, you know, like I said, I'm starting a Houston office, but it's going to start small for now, and then as we get moving towards where JSC is, is good at, like the, the execution phase, then we'll have more folks here. Um, you know, when it comes to jobs, um, the problem we have right now is not money. If, if you look at it, the, the amount of money that's going to be in human spaceflight is about the same. Uh, the problem is we don't have contract mechanisms to keep people working. Uh, and the key to having contracts uh, in place is to make decisions on how we're going to move forward so that those contracts can get uh, laid out and people can be put back to work. Now, some of the jobs will probably move. Uh, and uh, there may be some uh, folks that need to move uh, away from Houston or away from the Cape uh, to different parts of the country. That's the, the, that is the way it works in uh, the defense industry and has for a long time. You can ask some of the people here who've, who've had moves like that uh, in their lives. But uh, the, the fact is there's going to be a need for the type of people that are here in Houston uh, in the, the human spaceflight program in the future, and the key is to make some decisions and move forward. And this is one of the things being on the end of the aisle. We're, we're kind of just uh, reiterating <laughs> yeah, ditto for everything they said. I mean, U ULA is looking to, to expand our presence down here, but a lot of it depends on what the, what the future holds. And that gets back to my previous comment about making some decisions. But, but we recognize that there's a lot of uh, expertise here in the, in the area that we want to tap into to help uh, uh, improve our vehicles for human spaceflight. So, so what, what's that mean in the future? I, I'm really not quite sure, but, but we, we certainly see a need there. And from orbital, we're, with our wing vehicle, we're similar to what John has mentioned. Um, looking at the resources and the critical skills that are here at JSC and draw upon that in support of uh, developing that vehicle. You know, draw upon JSC and the NASA folks and their NASA contractors to help us uh, make that vehicle happen. I think we have time for one or two more. Mary Ann? Over here. I'm Marianne Dyson with National Space Society. We're going to be doing a blitz on Capitol Hill in about two weeks. And what message would you like us to take to our members of Congress that would help you? Uh, I, I assume the, you want them to make some decisions. So what would you like us to say to them? That's a scary one. You've got to be careful what you say, right? Uh, well, I think uh, we endorse what the administrator said on, I think it was Wednesday, at the FAA Council, that uh, NASA should uh, work to, to leverage commercial, commercial capabilities for LEO uh, so that they can save some money, quite frankly, so that NASA can then go do those hard things on exploration. So I think that's a very good, uh, very good mix. 
and it'll allow uh, the opportunity for commercial space. And at the same time, NASA can go back to doing what they're good at. No takers. Anyone want to tell Congress anything? This is your big chance, guys. Come on. All right, go Sox. Well, I mean, what would really what would really help is an appropriations bill. You know? yeah. I mean, that's what we need. I mean, we can't move out with commercial crew until there's enough money there to, to do the job, and that's what we're all waiting for. Yeah, I, I, I again agree with all of this. You, you know, I think I think it's important, if I just sort of focus in on, on commercial crew, um, I, I think it's important for everybody to understand that NASA is at a, at a, at a key point uh, where they can make some decisions on uh, how to, how to uh, structure that program, the way they do the acquisition approach, uh, the way they fund that, the, 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 the milestones they give everybody to meet. Uh, it, it, and, and the requirements they levy on uh, everybody up here to provide that service is really critical now because um, uh, NASA can decide to make that a very uh, cumbersome uh, and, and burdensome program such that uh, it'll never be commercially viable, uh, which is, I think, something everybody here wants. We want to see more flights to LEO, um, and, and, and NASA really has to, has to decide what they want that program to look like because we don't want to get three years down the road, two years down the road, and find out, geez, we have an unexecutable program because that's not good for any of us, especially if we're investing our own uh, company money in this. So, so, so NASA needs to, and, and Congress for that matter, needs to, to recognize that, that they got to help, they got to give NASA the flexibility to develop a, 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 and implement a program that's commercially viable. Um, you know, we've been working with uh, with Bigelow for years as, as well, and we really want to see him be successful. But NASA NASA can can help enable these other adjacent markets by the actions they take here in the in the near term. So that that's something we I, maybe that's a Jeff Patton perspective that, that we would like to see uh, 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 NASA and, and Congress decide is, is let's let's make commercially vi or commercial viable. Good comment, Jeff. Uh, I think we have time for one one more. Thank you. Um, and gentlemen, thank you for coming out to do this. I'm actually a member of Joe Smo Public. I do not work for NASA. Um, and I know how chat rooms work, and I know how space ups work. And I'm going to be bold and ask you guys this, because I know everyone in here has questions, especially me. Um, and I know we want to continue this discussion. And with the wiki page on space up and everything, would you guys be willing to take questions, whether via email, if someone gets your contact information so these people can continue asking you the questions they want and I can continue asking you the questions they want because A, it's going to be outreach for you and B, it's going to give us the information we want from you with time to uh, formulate answers instead of being on the spot. So would you guys be willing to do something like that if someone started setting it up? Absolutely. Would you guys in here like it if they did something like that for you guys? Yeah. Okay. It was short and sweet, yes, very good. Anyway, I want to thank you all for coming. A great panel, and uh, particularly on a Saturday night. So, and the audience, too. And thanks very much, and uh, turn it over to Jim. All right, thank you. Yeah. I don't know how many of you have ever witnessed this sort of thing before, but this is actually kind of historic to see this many competitors together agreeing on the same agenda, which is really, we need to move forward with human spaceflight and stop fooling around. So I appreciate the fact that you all brought that message here. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, I, I have to defend, so. defend the program of records. <laughs> <laughs> so. There you go, somebody take the picture real fast. So, um, I, before we go out for the star party, uh, Cindy had a few words that she wanted to say to the panel as well, and so uh, thank you all, and here's Cindy. You're running out of hands. You're running out of hands. Would you here. be my, yeah, thank yeah, you. you. Okay, you're my mic, my, yeah, my mic man. Wow. This is what you get here. So I want to share the power of social media with you gentlemen. And where's a woman? Um, excuse me. Just want to point that out. Okay. So, um, oh, of course. <laughs> How did I forget that? Um, so somebody tweeted this earlier, and they said, Houston, you know this commercial panel? Awesome info. The problem is I'm just now hearing about it. Please be proud and talk more publicly about it to the general public. 
So this person may or may not be in, this, in the room. I will not disclose that information. Um, so that's just letting you know that, yes, you're just starting, well, in the last couple of months, you've started going out to different conferences and sharing the information, but it doesn't get out to the public from just the conferences. So we're glad to have you here, and I appreciate you being here. Also with, also with videos. Um, we tweeted that ULA Launch was here, and someone said that ULALaunch.com has awesome launch videos to share. So, a <laughs> um, little competition there for the others. And uh, <laughs> um, also, another tweet was just an awesome commercial space panel here tonight, and we thank you all for taking the time to come out. I would like to thank you with Cakey Pops, which are cake um, balls on a stick, very original. Um, these were donated. Um, there is a woman who's starting her own business. It's Delectable Pies, and she, we have them for everybody. So. What's the way? It's, it's this way, and it's a dragon. <laughs> Terrific. So um, before I hand these to you, I'm going to let everybody know. Craft Last is going to play in here music um, until 10 o'clock. The telescopes are set up outside. It's clear skies, so enjoy the telescopes. And I believe our um, panel members are going to be around for networking in the lobby. Um, if you guys would like to ask them any questions, network with each other, and we'll see you. I will kick you out at 10 because I want to go home and go to sleep. And we'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.